Hi, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, September 13th, 2013. Friday the 13th. <laughs> I'm sure this will be fine. Uh, so uh, this week, we've <laughs> got go an uh, update, update on, the, on the Laddie launch, uh, the Space Frog. Uh, <laughs> Asteroid 334, the fact that Voyager has finally left the solar system for reals this time. We promise. Uh, Comet Lovejoy, part four. Uh, lots and lots of globular clusters. Globular clusters. Uh, Space-based solar power. Uh, the assembly of the Maven spacecraft. And uh, Expedition 34 has returned from space. Uh, and joining me this week, we've got our panel of space experts, space journalists. So I'm going to introduce them in no particular order. Well, the order that I have from left to right. Uh, so we've got Amy Sure Title from Vintage Space. Hello. Hey, Amy. Uh, we've got Brian Wang, who is a new member to the Weekly Space Hangout and is having some technical difficulties, so uh, we'll, he'll come and go. But Brian is the pu is the publisher of Next Big Future, which is a uh, an awesome website. And Brian also is the person who manages the Carnival of Space and sort of took it over for me when I was too busy and too disorganized to handle something of that level of... <laughs> Competency. So, so Brian has been running it tirelessly for years now, and he's awesome. So, uh, but hopefully he can make it back in, and he's got some really cool, a really cool story for us as well. So, uh, we've got David Dickinson. Hey. Yet another self-published sci-fi author. And I, and I spell sci-fi the correct way. Now I'm going to give you two chances to just promote yourself here, David. Quickly, okay. you've got something really exciting that's happened. Yes, I finally joined the legions of the... I finally got tired of getting rejected by magazines and started self-publishing my stories. So I've got two... One that's not quite live yet, it just went up this morning, but I've got one science fiction story in my Solar Winds universe is now live up on Amazon. For sale, 99 cents. And where do we... At, at Amazon. So the, search for yes. your name. What's yeah. the name of the... What's the, the, name story, of the story The story is called Solar Wind Scorpius Cell. So... So uh, this may become a no this may become a novel eventually. This is like the first standalone story in the in the whole saga. So it's we'll see. Yeah, uh, I've just put it as a comment on the event page. So if you're on okay. Google Plus, you can get to Google Plus. Okay. Great. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Matthew Francis. Now, do you appear to have a great old one on your head? Do I? Oh no, I do. <laughs> this is. Uh... This, believe it or not, is to raise awareness for uh, we're fundraising money for a few of us, including Nicole, to travel to Geek Girl Con next month. So, uh, oh my God, that's next see. month already. <laughs> yes, I know it is next month. I know it's it's kind of scary, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but not as scary as my headgear. Um, so anyway, uh, we'll we'll put that link up on the event page as well. But uh, and now I need to remove the hat because my head is. Boilingly hot. You well, like replace it with a bowler cap then. Yeah, that's down. You came up with the brand. That's your. It's your yep. thing. Um, and we've got uh, Nancy Atkinson, my uh, they are the my good friend, the editor of Universe Today. Hey there. Site. I check out the the little sign in your background if you're. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Editorial desk. That's great. All right, and uh, last but not least, we've got uh, Dr. Nicole Gallucci. Hello. So yes, yeah, so 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 Matthew's thing is to wear his Cthulhu hat in public. My thing for the fundraiser is to uh, make Mad Libs out of people's science abstracts. So if you join us tonight at eight Eastern, we'll be doing a hangout on air where we uh, chop up some scientists, some abstracts of our scientists, uh, and you can help us Mad Lib it. And uh, trust me, it is a good time. That so. is funny. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so Brian, is this working yet, or is he locked, frozen up again? He's looking very thoughtful, though. <laughs> oh, well. Um, okay, so now we're going to do one thing that's a little weird today, and I actually, Nicole has no idea that this is happening, and so I apologize in advance. Uh, yeah. Um, sometimes I should share. So anyway, so we've got three copies of Star Trek Into Darkness that we had been given to us from at Universe Today. We get tons of stuff. We give them away on Universe Today. And so what we wanted to do was give them away at the end of this broadcast. And so lots of people have been entering this uh, this giveaway over the course of the last week and we wanted to have it wrap up today at uh, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So if you haven't already, in another browser tab, go to Universe Today and I'm sure we'll put a link in the comments somewhere, uh, is the uh, the giveaway for the uh, 
um, for the Star Trek Into Darkness. We've got three copies, and uh, I'll just draw the names at the end, and uh, and so all you have to do is put your email into the little box on the giveaway page, and then you can, uh, and then you'll be entered. And you've got until the end of this this uh, weekly space hangout. And when it wraps up, I will do the draw, and uh, that's that. So there you go. All right. Oh, I see where the ask a question thing comes in. Yeah, okay, and so this is the last thing, is that uh, there's a new service that's been provided by Google Plus for doing uh, Hangouts on Air, and it is a audience questions. And we have no idea how the thing works. It just got enabled for us, so I just like to run this kind of technology on the fly. If so what does it do? If you're looking I don't at know. If you're looking at the stream, if you're looking at the Hangout, I, I don't know where it is on the event page, but if you... Come if you see this pop up anywhere in your stream. There's a little thing that says Fraser Kane is ask, answering questions live. Ask a question. Shows up right there on the video. Are you guys all seeing my video yes. freak out? Okay. It looks kind of yeah. Austin Powers ish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I will futz with that. But yeah. Okay. Um. So if you see it in stream, it, there's a little thing on the video that says ask a question. So that's where uh, you can do that. But we will still be monitoring the comments on YouTube and the Google event page just as we usually do. Yeah, so so we have no idea how to integrate this into our show. Uh, we'll figure it out. All right, moving on. Uh, Mind me. That's something. All right. I'm going to give you guys <laughs> We're gonna, yeah, I hope nobody's epileptic watching. On seizures. Okay, we're done with that. <laughs> <laughs> Try bringing it back, see if it works. You probably need to unplug your camera and plug it back in. Okay, so on last Friday, we reminded you to, to especially if you lived on the East Coast, to go and watch the launch of the Laddie uh, mission. And uh, But Dr. Matthew Francis was actually there on location. And while you're talking... Uh, I'm going to try and uh, get a video going. So, so give Great. us the, give us your story on on what happened, how you saw it. Well, uh, it uh, it happens to be the first rocket launched to the moon from NASA's Wallops uh, Wallops Island Flight Facility in Virginia, which um, for me is relatively close by, only about three and a half hour drive for me, which uh, for is is you know given. Driving to Florida has been beyond my means, so I absolutely had to go see this. And uh, it's a a new rocket, well, new newish recycled parts rocket made from an old ICBM. Um, I think this is a editorial comment, a much better use for it than war. Um, but it's a five stage rocket, uh, uh, and everything went flawlessly. The rocket went at. Uh, uh, roughly 11.30 p.m. on last Friday night, and uh, a bunch of us sat on bleachers like a high school football game and watched it go, and it was it was a great, great amount of fun, but it contains the, the lunar atmosphere uh, and dust environment explorer, Laddie, and it is pronounced Laddie arbitrarily rather than Lady. Um, don't ask me why. Um, and Fraser has the video up. Um, it was there, a, uh, there, there were some outstanding pictures. All it looked like everybody on the East Coast had clear skies all the way up through to Rhode Island. So yes, I, I there were some very clear ones from New York City, and yeah. as uh, I'm not sure if South Carolina saw, but certainly there were some pictures from North Carolina, which it, was really it, awesome. It felt weird in Florida to actually sit this one out and not see it. Because we're used to seeing launches all the time. Greedy. Oh, poor you. <laughs> so you know, greedy. I had to watch it on the net. Aww. Yeah, yeah for, for once, we get a rocket launch, and you're the one complaining about we, it. We are spoiled, yeah, because we just, people, you know, sometimes we just let them go and not even bother because we see them all the time. But. Oh. Yeah, this was this was so great for pe pe getting reports from people there in was New a York stage? City seeing yeah. it. It was like a five-stage rocket, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, so there goes a stage that just went... Yeah, we could clearly see the firing of the second stage and the firing of the third stage. Uh, the the other stages were beyond the horizon, but uh, um, yeah, we could see that we could see the co the brief coast stage as well. So it was again incredible, and every time this stage would fire, everybody cheered. Amy, did you see it down where you were? 
Um, no, I didn't. Not only okay. could, did we not have a clear horizon, but I was definitely asleep. Oh, okay. It was, it yeah, was pretty I'm low. I'm a morning for you person. I can't yeah. stay up till like midnight. I'm, <laughs> I'm lame. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, we, I wouldn't have been able to see it anyways. I think a five degree inclination. It is was low. pretty low. Yeah, really low to the like, horizon. Like, not over any of the buildings near us. We just couldn't drive out, so. So the ones I know, the people I know who saw it in North Carolina had to, to go up on top of buildings. Mm -hmm. so, so what's next for this mission then? What's going to happen? Well, they are currently, uh, let's see, and I've got to check the timeline, but they are preparing for the burn to actually take them to the moon. Um, is that right? They haven't, they haven't actually fired the main engine But it's a yet. really long mission. To, it's a really long transfer orbit to the moon. It's going to take like 27 days, right? Well, that's because the because of the trajectory they want to do. Um, first of all, they want the the orbit of the Earth is to get it into position for the type of orbit they're going to send it to the Moon. Um, they they are wanting to fly over uh, a significant portion of the Moon, including uh, towards the polar regions. So they're they're doing kind of an odd orbit compared to what they might be doing if they were doing a straight shot. Um, I may see if I when, when we when we switch over to somebody else, I'll see if I can find the the trajectory or somebody else. Sure. Can while I'm okay. Talking. Okay. But it's it's it is kind of an unusual target, and of course, eventually, they're going to want to bring Laddie in very close to the surface of the moon. It's a much lower orbit, and to maintain that, they have to basically be burning the engines a lot more, which is part of the reason why the mission is is only going to be about a hundred days. So it's um, so it's going to be flying, skimming over the surface of the moon to try to sample as much of the dust and and what passes for an atmosphere on the moon as they can. Yeah, um, it's a very tenuous atmosphere, and so to be able to measure what what is what is actually surrounding the moon? They have to be flying so low that they can scoop it up in these in these coffee can size and shaped instruments to to hoover the stuff up and and see what they can analyze from it. So, and what that means is it just can't last very long. And at the end of the mission, it's just going to crash in just like the uh, the Grail spacecraft did. So so let's uh, we will switch to somebody else right now, which I think we're going to talk with Nancy, and we're going to talk about the space Space frog. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is an image that basically is something that you just can't believe really exists. It's uh, a picture of uh, a frog during the launch that got launched. <laughs> Obviously, it was uh, sitting there near the uh, near the launch pad, and uh, it just got got launched when uh, the Minotaur V rocket fired its engines. So. Now we there someone had tweeted a, a link to this picture and I think it showed up on on Reddit but you got your hands on it pretty quickly and we had a really hard time verifying that it was real. Right. Yeah, I, I had seen it on universe on um on Reddit and Imager and there is no uh uh you know, authorship given there. There's no info on who took the image. And we're we're kind of meticulous on universe today about making sure that we give credit to the authors and uh, the photographers and that kind of thing. And I didn't want to post if, if it wasn't, if I didn't have permission, if it wasn't a NASA image, that kind of thing. And uh, it actually took a while to figure out where this image came from and because uh, uh, NASA did not post it on their, uh, their uh, the NASA HQ Flickr stream or they had a special Flickr stream for the Laddie launch and they didn't have it on any official page. For, for a while, and uh, so I couldn't verify it, so I was uh, had contacted a few different people and wasn't getting replies. Finally, um, uh, I posted something on Google Plus saying, you know, does anybody know anything about this image? And uh, a guy from Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, Carl Hill, I'll mention his name, uh, contacted uh, or got me in touch with uh, the people at Wallops, and uh, they, they verified that, yeah, this is a real picture, it's not a shop job. And uh, so we posted it, and uh, it pretty much went viral after that. And then, uh, to give NASA credit, I, they then posted it and and verified it 100% on their website that uh, it was it was a real picture. I, I 
kind of think that they didn't have posted it originally because I think they were worried about maybe some PR problems with uh, animal rights activists or something. Mm -hmm. But but uh, once once they realized it was out there and they couldn't do anything about it, they they took it and ran with it. In fact, I think they came up with the best headline of anybody: "Frog Photo Bomb." So yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've got a couple people in the comments concerned about the welfare of the frog, uh, and I well, don't think uh, it's clear what happened to it. It may have well, suffered the same fate as Brian the bat, yeah. which was uh, attached to some <laughs> launch or another. I can't remember. There, there's got to well, be a video of that up. somewhere. There's got that's got to be a still out of a video. You would think it's probably really quick. He's only in one or two frames, but I kind of wonder. So, yeah. so we got a question from the question machine. And Whoa. it has said, has anyone even considered that this might not be a frog? Maybe it's an <laughs> alien species just keeping a close eye on our space programs. This is from <laughs> Katharina Saville. Uh, possible this is the, probable. <laughs> the possible probable. <clears throat> well, uh, you know somebody it, did, somebody did an close. animated GIF of uh, that it actually uh, later on a parachute came out and that kind of thing. So it was, <laughs> it was really cute. Yeah. Have you and seen one of the NASA guys tweeted that? Now this isn't the first time that wildlife has interacted with the uh, space program, right? I mean, there's space right. bat. Yeah, Brian we mentioned the bat. The Brian the bat, and of course that that was officially named by Ian O'Neill, mm -hmm. uh, and then he also he also just named the the space frog to a Frank the frog. Um, but just today, uh, for anybody who's concerned about the welfare of the frog, the frog has started tweeting, so we know he's okay. <laughs> there was there was a shuttle launch a few years ago that there was a spider on the camera lens, and it looked like kind of like one of the old Godzilla movies where the spider was climbing up the orbiter, kind of. Right. Person. Yeah. I want to I want to show you a picture of, that I love of Brian the bat. Um, let me just see if I can find this one here. Oh, and while while we're while we're on this subject, there was a fairly <laughs> substantial brush fire. Um, He's like from the uh, <laughs> from the rocket launch. Oh wow! Oh wow! Yeah, it's uh, it, it, it after the rocket was was airborne, we noticed that there was a the glow on the ground was continuing. <laughs> And uh, so they rushed all the fire engines over there and put it out, but evidently that is a fairly normal thing to happen. Well, just you light in, in the environment on fire. Antares is launching from Wallops next week to the ISS, too, so maybe the, oh, maybe right. the frog will make an encore appearance. Who knows? Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, expect we... lots of Photoshops. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, the other big story. I would have to say... Well, let's talk about Asteroid 334, David. So yeah, we're going to get uh, this, a visitation from a this, from a really big asteroid. Cl closest kind of relative with this one because it's still going to be 0.81 AU from us, so it's still going to be quite a ways away. But what's unique about this? Uh, earlier today, 324 Bamberga reached opposition, and it's on a four-year orbit, but it reaches a favorable opposition once every 22 years. It's roughly in a five-to-one resonance with us. This is one of the few large number asteroids that you can actually see with binoculars. I've been tracking it this week. It's about eighth magnitude moving through Pisces right now. It was found back in the 1890s by uh, Johann Palissa, who found over 100 asteroids visually. And it's interesting that this one, the only other high number asteroids you can ever track with binoculars are 433 Eros, 47179 Tutatis, and I think those are about it for the asteroids that are over 100. Now, I know you can see Vesta and Ceres with the naked eye, but they never come that close. They never come. Point AU, point 0.8 AU is still, it's about 80% of the distance from here to the sun. But this, is, uh, this asteroid is 230 kilometers in size, and it's interesting to track. We won't see this one again. I remember when there was a big deal when it came around 1991, and we won't see it again until 2035. So if we're writing cyber blogging, do have our heads in the jar, whatever we're doing, and by 2035 we'll be able to write about uh, 324 Bamberger again. And it's, I mean, they say it's coming close, but it's not going to be that close. It's not like within lunar distance close, but this is notable because it's a high-numbered asteroid, and it's a large, like, you know, a little smaller than Pallas and Juno, but all those have low numbers because they were discovered early on. Uh, June or Ceres was found on New Year's Day in the first century of the, the first day of the 19th century in 1801. So it took them nearly 90 years before they found 324 Bamberga. They found 323 asteroids before they found this one. And something I didn't know till I started researching this, uh, as a friend of mine turned me on to this. 
for visual asteroid discovery, more asteroids are discovered in September than any other month, nearly twice the number statistically, saying that of the first 1,940 visual asteroids discovered, 344 of them were found in September. It took me a little bit of puzzling to figure out why that was. Turns out that when they're searching for asteroids visually, they're usually looking at the opposition point. It's the, the point that's opposite to the sun because they're looking for asteroids that just happen to be coming into opposition at that time. And what happens is when you're looking in the winter time, you're looking near the solstices, you're actually looking out at the part of the sky, the opposition point is toward the Milky Way where it's very star rich, so it's very hard mm -hmm. to see asteroids. Right now as we're approaching the equinoxes, you're looking out toward Pisces when you're looking at the opposition point. So you're more likely to see uh, the, the area is, is less star rich out in that direction. So right around the March and September equinoxes are generally when you might see it, you're looking out away from the plane of the galaxy. So I, I didn't know that about September that it was special for that, but it was kind of interesting. So is that when the, I assume they're looking along the ecliptic then? Yes, they're looking so, along. So it's when the, the ecliptic is furthest away from, from the Milky Way. Yeah, they're looking along at the uh, the anti-solar point. I didn't know for visual asteroid discoveries that they, they that was their hunting strategy traditionally, was that they would look out toward where there would be asteroids reaching opposition, hoping to sweep them up. But when I looked at uh, uh, Johann Polissa's record, who found 324 Bamberga, his own record of 120-something asteroids, I believe, he found more in September than any other month, too. It was also... He didn't find 324 Bamberga in, in September, ironically. He found it in February, so it didn't meet that trend. But his own statistical record bore that out. But I didn't know that about September. Voyager has left the solar system. Not exactly. Amy... Yeah, again. <laughs> um, okay, so I started calling Voyager the little spacecraft that cried interstellar. Because um, how many times have we had this, This like, it's gone, it's gone. No, it's not. Sorry, we take it back. Um, it's really gone interstellar this time. So NASA held a press conference yesterday and talked about um, the fact that, that Voyager has officially become an interstellar spacecraft and it has left the heliosphere, which is the, the kind of bubble of material created by the solar wind. Um, but it hasn't left the solar system because the solar system since the 1960s-ish has been defined as ending around the Oort cloud. And that Voy or, yeah, Voyager is still some 300 years away from getting to the inner bit of the Oort cloud and like 30,000 or 40,000 years away from the outer edge of it. So it's, it's, we're not going to see it properly leave the solar system. But the interesting thing in the press conference yesterday, and I don't know if any of you guys were also watching that, but they talked a little bit about why it's been so hard to make the definitive call about when Voyager left the solar system slash left the heliosphere. I'm going to mess this up for all the proper astronomers out there with my terminology. I'm sorry. Um, so what, what it boils down to is the fact that Voyager is really old. Um, by, like, spacecraft standards, not by human standards. It's 36. Um, and a lot of its instruments are starting to fail. And among them, one of the main plasma instruments that determines the, or measures the density, temperature, and speed of plasma moving. So the Voyager science team has been looking at changes of plasma because that's, that's going to be their indication of when it's actually left the heliosphere. Well, without without these, you know, really good instruments to measure plasma, it had nothing to go on. So what they used was these, those sticky-outy antenna that come out the bottom. I don't have a model or a picture. I've got a picture. There's a video going right now. Antenna? Oh, sorry. I'm looking at my article. <laughs> um, for all you the mean details. those antenna right there? Yeah, the big, the big spindly ones. Um, they measure, they measure uh, disturbances in, ma in magnetic fields. And they have been able to use that as a proxy for changes of plasma, and that that's just sounds cool. Um, so what what they what they've been looking at is sort of these. They expected like a pretty big change of the magnetic field when Voyager would pass through that sort of edge of the heliosphere because the sun's magnetic field looks different than the interstellar magnetic field. And what they've seen in months past has been a change, but not enough of a change. But there's still enough of a change that it's different and. So, uh, yeah, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> They've been going through old data and, and realized that sort of definitively it is outside the heliosphere and that it's just been sort of 
pulling together all of this data over over a year now. Um, it formally left the solar system or the heliosphere. They're putting the data at around August 2012. Um, so yeah, it's um it's out of the heliosphere, but it's still in the solar system. So that's but, that's gonna bother a lot of people. I think. Now, yeah, well, uh, I think that it's hairs, but it's it's pretty better. cool. <laughs> a better way to say it might be that it's it's in interstellar space, but it's still yes. on our solar system. Yes, it's it hasn't left the area where the sun's material has its influence, and it's still mainly tied to the sun in terms of all that, you know, and it science, won't for physics-y about stuff. Ten thousand years. Right? Yeah, I think I think they said forty thousand in in forty thousand years it will be closer to the nearest star, which is AC plus seventy nine three eight eight eight. Than it is to our sun, so we've got a while before it stops yeah. being sort of a solar object, if you will. But, but. doesn't and and like a, I know we we didn't bring a solar physicist today, but I hope I can put <laughs> two doctors of astrophysics and radio astronomy together and see what we get. Um, which is it doesn't the size of the heliosphere depend on the amount, the sort of the state of the sun's output? But I guess we're at the solar max right now, and so the solar wind, the heliosphere, expands and contracts a bit depending on the amount of solar activity, doesn't it? So haven't we had situations where Voyager has, has crossed the heliosphere and then the heliosphere has crossed Voyager and, and back and forth? Well, that was kind of one of the things that helped them make the determination is because there was this huge um, coronal mass ejection back in... Uh, uh, last year, March, tw one yeah, March of 2012, and by the t and then it got out to Voyager by about August, and that's uh, that was one of the things that uh, helped them uh, see the difference because this uh, the solar plasma started vibrating, and but they realized it was different from if it was because the um, the pl the plasma from interstellar space is much denser than the solar plasma. So right. they could see there was a, a, a big difference in, in how the plasma reacted. So you, uh, you know was... although although technically we're at max right now, the sun is blank. There's almost no sunspots earthward. Yeah. I watch the sun every day and it's it's uh, been very very wimpy this solar maximum. Um, right, so to be pedantic, to so I think it's important yeah. <laughs> to be pedantic here it's really important to say to anyone who says that the Voyager has left the solar system, that is not the case. Voyager has passed out of the heliosphere and is now an interstellar in the interstellar medium. Yes. Yes. I will be contrary. I will be contrary and defend people who say that Voyager has left the solar system, though. Then, do you by not all believe means. in the Oort cloud? <laughs> well, no, no, I believe in the Oort cloud. I'm just saying that there's, there's more than there's more than there. You you can logically say that there's more than one boundary to the solar system, yeah. and the fact is that that's not you know it. Yes, it is. It has not left the gravitational boundary, but that's that's much less of a clear thing because gravity goes out forever, right? Gravity extends infinitely far. One of our far. squared, it's infinite, yeah. So, so really, what you're looking at is where does it, so if you're looking at it from a gravitational point of view, the boundary is even less clear because it really depends on where other stars' influence starts kicking in. Well, that changes a lot over time, so. You know, I'm, I will defend you if you say that Voyager left the solar system because it's a lot easier to define the edge of the solar system based on where the sun's magnetic influence ends. And uh, yeah, so I, I would, the way I put it in my article was that there's multiple ways to define the edge of the solar system. This is the electromagnetic boundary of the solar system, and uh, the gravitational boundary is the Oort cloud. So, so. I will I will fight for both both sides because I'm that kind of person. I'm so a both yeah. and kind of guy. I, I almost not wonder how, it's not how many I almost wonder how many alien voyagers might be orbiting the galactic disk right now. Kind of an extension of the whole Drake equation, you know, if you could plug in how many the old Fermi paradox thing. Yeah, well, if you could plug in how many. Let's see, we've sent out two pioneers, two voyagers, and New Horizons. You could figure over 50 years of the space program, maybe once every 10 years. We send a probe out that leaves our, our solar system. So, if you, yeah. if you plug that into the end of the Drake equation, I wonder how many how many million alien voyagers are out there right now. That and then you could say of the where square, are they? Yeah, you, you could say what's the density per square light year, and then you could say maybe <laughs> you know. So we're getting some questions about the size of. 
the heliosphere versus the Oort cloud, and I, I put I put this image in the comments, um, but I forgot to point out, and thank you, Hugo, for pointing out um, that this is a logarithmic scale. So, in reality, it's you know this is not a linear scale; it's stretched out much more. Um, so, what we're considering that it's left is uh, I don't know if you guys can see my pointer. Um, it's leaving this this heliosphere, this boundary here. Now you see that there are different boundaries even to that, and that's why we keep getting all these different. Um, it's why we've heard this story so many times that it's left the heliosphere, it's left the heliosphere, has it really left the heliosphere? Then it's another good factor of a hundred um, or more, hundred to a thousand to, to get out to the Oort cloud. And so what was the, Amy, I think you mentioned how long it will take to get to the Oort cloud? Uh, 300, 300 years, years for the inner ring and 30,000 to the outer bit. Okay, so that, that answers a question that I just saw come up about, uh, I think it was Michael Jobin. Uh, so 30,000 years, you got to wait till it gets leaves the Oort cloud boundary. It's definitely going to be quiet by then. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely not going to get any data back about that one. Yeah, well, all the instruments are going to be turned off by 2025, which is yeah. sad to think that that's kind of relatively soon. But mm -hmm. they said they can still keep tabs on it for 10 more years after that, just uh, following the engineering data. That's madness that yeah. they can they can have that spacecraft going for so long. Yeah. Yeah. RTGs all the way. I and love I say, Voyager. It's really awesome. Voyager, I love. They finally gave us an explanation on like why we kept getting all of these. They haven't really done that before. Has anyone else been really annoyed by that? <laughs> yeah, I really thought it was kept, interesting that they mentioned why the why the papers kind of went back and forth. Yeah, and I don't know if I you want to talk about it or happy. No, no, okay. I uh, it's I'm okay. not enough of a physicist to really understand how it all like goes together and and what. Oh all well, I was just talking are, about but why some papers said it was out and oh. then Ed Stone kept insisting that it was not in. And I, right. I, I, I give him credit for being the last word on it since he's been the project scientist for 40 years <laughs> on it. But, uh, you know, they were just saying yeah. how, well, there was, and actually back in August of last year when, when the first, this first uh, kind of wave of papers and, and uh, people coming out saying out that so, uh, Voyager had left the solar system did happen in August when, when they did see that event. And it was more of a, a semantics, or not a semantics things, but just a timing thing of what, if people are going to come out and say it or if they're going to write a peer-reviewed paper about it and, and have that released. And so that's kind of what happened. And even with the one, so there was the paper, uh, somebody said in August that they saw a change that would indicate that Voyager was out of the solar system or had, you know, was in interstellar space. Headstone says, no, the data's not there yet. And then another one came out in December. Again, Ed Stone says, no, we don't have the definitive data. And then in just uh, uh, like in March of 2013, another paper came out. Again, Ed Stone says, no, not enough data. And then just about a month ago, a paper came out. And uh, uh, Don Gurnett, yesterday at the press conference, he's the, um, the scientist for the, the plasma wave uh, experiment that did make the determination. He said that the the paper that came out a month ago actually went through the the peer review process quicker than Ed Stone and Don Grenet's paper <laughs> went. So they could not say at that time they couldn't say, "Oh, we agree with you" because their paper hadn't been approved yet. So that's kind of weird. Kind of just, weird. Yeah. Yeah. Just the way paper review peer review goes. Um, okay, so uh, new comment, Lovejoy. David. Yes, Terry Lovejoy has just bagged his fourth comment. Uh, everybody knows from the comment Lovejoy that came around. Uh, it was around Christmas a couple of years ago that was visible in the Southern Hemisphere, and they got a good photo from the ISS, and we missed it up here. But yes, um, yes, there was a comment he discovered this week. Is comment C two thousand twelve R one Lovejoy has got his official designation. This one's not going to be as bright, but it will be a binocular object. Right now, it's about 14th magnitude in the constellation Orion. Uh, Bob King just wrote an article on uh, Universe Today about it. And in November, around November, December time frame, it should increase up to about 8th magnitude. Now, it's going to pass about 61.3 million miles or kilometers from the Earth, so it's not coming especially close. Uh, but it'll be a but not, anytime a comet gets above tenth magnitude, it usually piques my interest. That's the first thing I'm looking at when I see a new comet discovery is the trajectory, how far away it was discovered. Because one of the things with comet Ison 
was we were seeing a comet relatively bright far away, so we knew it was a big object coming in. And it was also uh, not technically a sun grazer. I know there's a lot of arguments about sun grazer, not sun grazer, but it was coming close to the sun, let's say that. Because I know on the message boards there's a lot of, well, it's not technically, it's not a Kruitz group sun grazer. But it's, it's uh, so this, this one will be an interesting one to see. We get a couple of these a year, binocular comets. They're not uncommon to see about up toward half a dozen or so that, that come through, either for northern or summer, southern hemisphere. I say binocular, I always consider about the 10th magnitude to be of interest. Uh, countdown on Ison, while you mentioned it, when, how long till it uh, disappoints us or <laughs> amazes us? I, I'm kind of gearing my, my writing, my How to Observe Comet Ison post to about mid-October. It should start breaking uh, naked, or not naked eye magnitude, but maybe about 10th magnitude or so. And it should become of interest. And, and there's still a lot of debate about the thing with comets, too, when you're talking magnitude, is you have that magnitude, kind of like with nebula, there it's diffuse over a, a spread out area. So you're not talking a tenth magnitude point source. So actually, it may not be a good binocular object till ninth or eighth magnitude. Give me the go, no go date. What I day? Was, I would say around early November we should know if it's underperforming or not. It's, it's right about on the light curve right now, maybe a pinch below it, but not too bad. I think it's right around 12th magnitude, I believe, right now. I would say around early November, about a month or so, three weeks or so before perihelion. I think after perihelion is where we're going to get the show, though, if it survives perihelion. So November 1st? I would say October November 1st, October 31st, November 1st, we should know if it's... Uh, if it's, it's going to happen. Yeah, it, sh it, it should be reaching naked eye range there right about 6 magnitude from a dark site right around that time. So. All right. Uh, I just need to know if I need to make you know vacation plans. I need to go to some <laughs> dark sky site and... It'll be in the morning, up. so no, we'll, we'll get a good show in the northern hemisphere. Uh, it'll, it's, it's actually going to whip back around the sun and come out in the morning. So, I uh, got a question from Guido Bibra. Uh, how fast is Voyager actually traveling? So I just looked that up. Uh, it's about thirty-five thousand miles an hour. Thirty-eight, uh, thirty-five, thirty-eight. I'm seeing both of those. Um, and I, I think you could eventually catch it with a small ion engine if you really wanted to, but that means putting money and effort into launching <laughs> <laughs> a rocket with an ion engine on it, and I just don't see that happening in the in the current budget situation. But yeah, an ion engine can uh, can accelerate for quite a long time and really get up to high speeds with. Um, very little fuel. Right. So what's, the, what's, the, what's the theoretical speed limit for an ion engine? I don't know. I'm not sure of that. Okay. Moving on. Uh, Nicole, you've got a story about an, a, a metric ton, a lot yes, of, a, lot. a, a <laughs> large quantity of globular clusters. Okay. We'll keep it clean. Yes, lots of globular clusters uh, that was discovered um, in a in a new Hubble image. Uh, this is the uh, it's a galaxy cluster, Abel 1689. It's a very dense galaxy cluster. It's got a large number of galaxies in it. Um, and each of these galaxies has its own globular clusters. I will try and screen share the image. Okay. Um, these globular clusters are some of the first inhabitants of these galaxies. They are uh, uh, clusters of stars, the oldest, some of the oldest stars in, in the in in the galaxy, in our galaxy, and in the universe in general. Um, for for these, and uh, they carry about a hundred thousand stars in them. Now the Milky Way has about 150 globular clusters scattered around it. Uh, here's the picture of the galaxy cluster. Um, so the yellow things in that picture are the galaxies in the galaxy cluster. And the galaxy cluster also has a lot of dark matter in it. And so the dark matter is used, um, the dark matter is measured by looking at microlensing or lensing of the background galaxies. <laughs> here's a spider <laughs> on <laughs> Fraser's microphone. <laughs> Sorry, I'm <not> distracted. <laughs> 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 Sorry, this is the picture that's up for me right now. I'm gonna make that go away. Sorry, distracted. Um, so these are the so these these little blue lines are background galaxies, star forming galaxies in the background. So they've got a lot of blue light from uh, younger, really <laughs> stars. Do you see it? <laughs> it's right up on the camera. Now you can't not see it. 
Speaking of animals <laughs> getting in cameras. Um, and then, so these galaxies each have uh, globular clusters around it. And so what's surprising is the, the sheer number of, of globular clusters found in this region. They have found 160,000 globular clusters overall in this um in this cluster, whereas our galaxy alone has only 150, and so each of these galaxies is has um, they've actually seen 10,000, and they estimate that there's 16 um, 160,000 wow. globular clusters. Why? Um, are why? These resolved? <laughs> uh, uh, I think that well, I think the 10,000. I would all, I want to say they're resolved to, you know, <laughs> several Well, I mean, pixels. obviously we're not expecting to see them as beautifully yeah. as we see around the Milky Way. I was just wondering how right. clearly you can see them as, as globular clusters. As... Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 must, I would guess, I didn't actually get to read the paper on this one, but I would guess they were looking at the spectral distribution of, of those those globs to, to see that it was a population of old stars, uh, as well as their locations in the outer regions of the galaxies in the galaxy cluster. So these are often used to trace uh, the size and shape of the the dark matter halos of galaxies because we still can't directly detect dark matter but we can see its gravitational effects on things around it and since globular clusters are embedded in this dark matter halo um, that's one way to actually trace that um, very cool that's really cool yeah uh, okay so Amy you're gonna you're gonna explain uh, as we watch Maven be constructed in, in a time lapse uh, every part so uh, let's get rolling. Uh, so let's get... it's a spacecraft. I can't explain every part of this time lapse, but it's a really cool time lapse. Um, I'm sort of waiting for it to come up on the screen. <laughs> I'm having troubles with my YouTube's today. No. So this, in the meantime, here's my Maven patch that I got in Boulder. This is what it looks like, everyone. Well, you you were there, right? Yes, I was there. I had the flu most of the weekend, but I was there, and it was very, very interesting. Um, oh, so, yeah, yeah no. there we go. David was there, too. <laughs> oh, were you? Maybe grab my... All right. <laughs> um, I, this sucks. Sorry about that. My About 25% of YouTube videos don't work for me. Darn it. It is really cool. I have that about, problem, too. What is it? It's about ten minutes long. It's a time lapse of it's so so the Maven spacecraft, which is the Mars atmosphere. I always have to look at the thing. The Mars atmosphere and volatile evolution mission, which is an aeronomy mission, looking at the the atmosphere of Mars and how it's evolved over time and all kinds of really awesome, weird, obscure science. Um, Oh, they, it's being built at Lockheed Martin, and they have just had a stationary camera on on the spacecraft as it's been constructed, and they put it together in this ten minute time lapse. Nicole, it's can you bring really this up? Cool. Uh, my I'm YouTube looking, is. Oh, did you did you just, send the link? No, well, I can send you the link. I mean, Amy is doing an amazing and highly professional job of attempting to talk about something <laughs> that doesn't exist, <laughs> and and I really think for that she gets a huge prop. Oh, here we go. Here we gold go. star. Yes, I okay. collect gold stars. Um, I will probably. Uh, there's no sound, right? Because I don't think I can do sound. There, there is sound, but it's just music. Oh, so, it's, okay. Imagine a jazz track, everybody. Yeah. Um, oh, there it goes. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's kind of neat. It's it's a little bit. I mean, it's a little bit long. You got to kind of settle in I'm to gonna, watch it, but it's kind of neat Here, to on. watch this thing come bored. together. That does and not this surprise is... me. <laughs> oh, and now I've worked it. All no. you ADD people here. Um. So there. what? I mean, there. I'm going to use this. I don't have a picture of it handy, to, and I, to, I always yeah. screw up the screen shares. But this is like this little bit is the main spacecraft, <laughs> and these things out the side are the solar panels. Um, so, so you're looking at in that video the sort of main meat of it getting put together, and there are pictures on the Maven website, which I can try to find right now, of it fully constructed and with the solar panel. There's actually a really cool video of the solar panel deploying, like test deploying. It's really neat. The thing is massive. It's the size of a school bus, which I don't know. It's just big. <laughs> So you guys can't see me, but I'm dancing to the jazz track. Yeah, I like yeah. behind yeah. the You're video. Dancing. We can't see you can dancing to music. We can't hear. Yeah. <laughs> Here. Is yeah. That coming through. So you're both doing it. Oh, it's, yeah, they're both playing it. Maybe yeah. lunch is on November 18th. I hope to be. There. Mine's better. Yeah, there's a week <laughs> long a week long launch window beginning yeah. on the 8th, 17th or 18th. Yeah, the 18th. 
18th is yeah. the first day of the window. And ah, India is India's the... trying to launch a mission a few weeks prior. There's two missions this Mars window that are trying to go. So yeah. We average about, we had two last mid window too, was uh, MSL and Phobos Grunt, which one made it and one didn't. So Yeah. I don't want to play favorites, but I really want to see Maven get there. So I really hope <laughs> oh, yeah. it works. Yeah. It'd be yeah, cool if, a... if India got theirs. They've never been. This would be their first interplanetary mission if they yeah. did. So I hope they yeah. both make it. Yeah. Yeah, we All wanted right. we wanted as many scientific instruments as possible working because a lot of times they're complementary in their abilities. India's I was reading yeah. about too. They did a press release on it. I was interested. Their orbiter is actually going to target the whole methane question. The the issue yeah. of is there or isn't there? So that's kind of Mars cows, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I think our last Peter story of the day, <clears throat> the last story, <laughs> is going to be this uh, uh, Expedition Thirty Six is returned to Earth. Yeah, and uh, uh, Nicole, if you can stop dancing just for a minute, you can share the cool picture. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, Hang on. Wednesday Nicole, morning. you are erasing every bit of professional uh, integrity that Amy delivered so Woo! well. So <laughs> come on now. <laughs> you described the time Nicole. lapse, Amy, without even complaining. You're like a machine. All right. <laughs> okay, so uh, Wednesday morning, Tuesday night, depending on where you were, the um, Expedition 36 crew came back from the International Space Station and. Uh, uh, NASA photographer Bill Ingalls just nailed this picture of it. That's I mean, there must have been he must have been in a helicopter shot. right above the you the Soyuz that. thrusters were firing just before yeah. it slammed into the ground. It's it's pretty cool. That's awesome. Uh, the guys that came home, uh, very interesting. They were doing a uh, as soon as they got home, you know, normally they let them sit in those chairs for a while to uh, get acclimated, but uh, they were doing an experiment with th these three guys when they came home. It's uh, Pavel Vinogradov, um, Alexander Mazurkin, and then Chris Cassidy from the U.S. And uh, they were going to have them stand up and try to walk around as quickly as possible because they were they were, um, doing a special experiment on these guys. And uh, Vinogradov is six, age 60, and he's the oldest guy to ever make the landing in, in a Soyuz craft. So uh, anyway, so right now on the ISS, we've just got the three um, astronauts, uh, Luca Parmitano from ESA, Karen Nyberg from USA, and um, Fyodor Yurchurkin from uh, 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 Russia. So they're up there, and then September 25th, we're going to have a launch uh, of a Soyuz, and uh, then it'll go back up to six again. So it's that's the latest the, for the ISS. It's going to be busy at the ISS because Antares is going out and trying to dock next week too. So yeah, exactly. There's a great website. I think it's how many people are in space right now. I think it's mm -hmm. the website, and it it'll just tell you the number. So if you yeah. just do a search for how many people are in space right now, and it'll say three, and then it'll <laughs> say six. Um, cool. Okay. Well, then I guess I need to. I think we're we're wrapped up, and so why don't I do my part here? We have a question on YouTube from Boxing Junior. Do you guys reckon we'll be able to travel to another star in the next hundred years? No. No. Go panel. <laughs> no. Um, Technolo technologically, not. yes. Will we have the will to do it? No. No. I well, think the the technology not with people. Is a hurdle. Not with. What people. do you mean no, by I technology? <laughs> We, we would need the uh, the old style Antari ships with uh, throwing the atom bombs out the back and accelerate yes. them, and but that's that would take yeah it would take a lot of will, national international will to want to build something like that. Yeah. And, and I, I think, think we could do it with an unmanned probe, but not not with humans. Well, and the other that, issue though is if you go at tremendous speed, if you go at tremendous speed, if you're going to go like if you want to do it within a like say you want to get to Alpha Centauri, it's four point three seven light years away. You're going to go 10% the speed of light. It's going to take you 40 years just to get there. And you're going 10% of the speed of light through the interstellar medium, which is a very dangerous thing to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, if but if you you're think hoovering that, up the, the atoms and using that as like a well, ramjet? That's a, like that's a, a whole jet, different... Yeah, yeah but are you, are you hoovering up the particles that are yeah. hitting your spacecraft at 10% the speed of light? So, so you're going to have to go slower. You're going to have to go make the journey in 100 years. Make, have, make the journey in... A we, thousand years. We, Humans we aren't gonna figure, go. It's gonna be robots. We gotta figure out how to do controlled fusion first and make an engine that could that could manage to use it. <laughs> yeah. But if we really wanted to do a generational send a probe, I think that could be done, but the will yeah. just isn't there. So mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love and, to see a pro I'd love to see small probes. 
you know, mm -hmm. and do a whole bunch of small redundant ones so it doesn't matter if we lose a couple. Yeah, how small could you, and that's the thing, like, would you send, you know, could, how small a probe could you send on a trajectory that could then arrow break when it reaches some other world? You know? I like when you hold up how small of a probe. How <laughs> small of a probe? <laughs> yeah. Could you be yeah. microscopic yeah, probes? Just throw a bunch of CubeSats out there. Yeah, no, so there, thinking... there we go. We, well, you, you could, if you had a bunch of net, small networked ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking I microscopic. I have no idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. really little. Um, and then which says that if we want to look for aliens, we should look for their little tiny probes. They could be so, here, just microscopic. Yeah, they're, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so I'm going to now I'm gonna try and do the draw. So uh, if you haven't already, uh, so we've got, uh, whoa, we've got 1,820 people have, uh, have entered this draw, so I'm going to choose the three names. All right, and I'm not going to do the whole thing. So we've got here H.G. Uh, Montano. We've got uh, Craig M. Chamberlain and Russian Cali. Oh, Damn it! And Nicole, <laughs> Nicole, yay! Yay! Are the three people that have that that have won our uh, uh, Star Trek Into Darkness uh, DVD Blu-ray giveaway? And uh, so we will pass along those names to the to the people, and they will send them out shortly. And so we do. We got a ton of giveaways, so we're going to try and queue them up. But there's actually three more giveaways on University Day. They're active right now. They, they've been throwing stuff at us like crazy. So, And the cool thing is that if you put your name, if once you enter the draw once, then you're put on a mailing list where we spam you with giveaway opportunities. So, uh, yeah, and so all you have to do is then you get an email, you just click the link, and you're entered in the next giveaway, and, and then you get your chances to win. So, cool. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. So let's, let's uh, say goodbye to everyone. So, Amy, your title, where do we find out more? Uh, you can find me, my website, amyshiretail.com, or my blog, Vintage Space, and I'm also at Discovery News, Motherboard, Scientific American, Al Jazeera, uh, blah, others, and Facebook, Twitter as AST Vintage Space, and Google+. And if you had one thing that you really wanted people to go and check out and see, what should they look at right now? Cool. What thing are you most proud of right now that you really want to log roll? One thing that hasn't been published yet, unfortunately. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. The so only wait, where will it be? Where, where will that thing will, be, and will when be. will it happen? I'm not sure. Sometimes next week at Ars Technica, but for now, um, the Voyager article I did on on Motherboard today is probably my most. Uh, so we go to relevant. motherboard.com, okay, and we read yeah. your article on Voyager. Yeah. And then we I, wait I for an unknown thing clear. in an unknown location. Thing. That's great, Amy. You <laughs> we'll should talk work about on it this. Next week. <laughs> I like an air of mystery around me, okay? Just I also <laughs> may or may not be working on something that may or may not come out anywhere. Um, okay, David, I give you one chance. And the reason I'm giving everyone else a chance is because now I'm going to give you another chance to promote the fact that you are yes, publishing I'm, books on I'm Amazon, which is shameless, awesome. shamelessly pl pl plug my short stories that have just come out that I'm experimenting with right now on Amazon. Uh, Scorpius Cell, these sci-fi so short stories. Scorpio Cell and The Hunt for Beagle, and that is, is in the Mars Beagle 2, but it is science fiction. Mars Beagle 2 was a real probe that actually didn't make it a few years ago that the Brits tried to land. And I am Astro Guys with a Z. I am active this week on Universe Today, Listasaur, and my own site, Astro Guys. Sweet. All right, Matthew, and, and so can you uh, tell us where we find out more and then promote your Geek Girl Con uh, requirements? Yes. All right, so uh, you can find out lots of stuff from me at bowlerhatscience.org. Also write at galileospendulum.org. Uh, Ars Technica, now slate.com, and nice. uh, a variety of other places. In fact, I did something not too long ago for Slate saying why the uh, warp drive concept that's be, been promoted off and on for the last year or so is uh, The best idea you've ever heard? Probably total nonsense. Oh, no. Sorry, folks. Um, but uh, that's up at slight.com. Um, and I what about the... Uh, every don't forget about the, the hat. Yes, and so uh, we have... Actually, you can check this out at uh, Galileo's Pendulum, but there's uh, a ability to help send me and Nicole and others to GeekGirl.com in... Uh, in uh, 
October in Seattle where we will be bringing do-it-yourself science to convention goers. So, and if you're in the Seattle area or want to attend Geek Girl, actually the tickets may be gone by now. I don't know how that works, if this is like oh. other cons where it vanishes instantly. But No, I don't think so. No, I think okay. still... So I'm there still might be still a chance to go. Yeah, okay, I great. Attend. So, uh, But if you're going to Geek Girl Con or thinking about going, you can see us there and make craters and do sciencey things. Awesome. Nancy Atkinson. You can find me at Universe Today every day. I also am the host of the NASA Lunar Science Institute podcast, soon to become the Survey podcast, Solar System Exploration and Virtual Institute. And um, what else? Uh, Nancy underscore A at Twitter. And uh, for a shameless plug, I just posted a really gorgeous time lapse from our friend Jack Fusco. It's uh, called uh, Night Sky at the Shore, and it should be on the top of Universe Today if you just go there right now. But it's gorgeous. When that do you sleep? You... When do I sleep? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, All right, Nicole. Sorry. Oh, hi. I'm Noisy Astronomer on Twitter and on the blogosphere. I work for CosmoQuest, and I'm also, yes, yeah, so I'm also involved in the do-it-yourself science zone thing with Matthew. Um, I already have my funding to go through CosmoQuest, so I'm not taking any of the money being raised, but uh, I know there's a lot of awesome people who don't have the funding yet, and so that's what this fundraiser is for. Also to get our materials and all that, all that junk so we can make craters and all crazy stuff. So tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, 5 p.m. Pacific, we will be doing, uh, check my profile, I have an event up, we'll be doing Mad Libs of some science abstracts, and every time we hit $1,000, we're going to Mad Libs another abstract, so stay tuned for that, it'll be a good time. Uh, I will probably, that that one the language will probably not be safe for work, uh, just to warn you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to open it up. Uh, we, you have no sound. Fraser. Uh -oh. <laughs> Spider ate your microphone. <laughs> no. You guys all saw it, right? I'm not going crazy. <laughs> virtual star party Sunday night. Yes. So the virtual star parties are next hangout on Sunday night. I think it's at 8:30 Pacific is what you guys are shooting yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. For or, yeah, it's uh, they moved it back half an hour, so hopefully. So yeah, look for the virtual back. star party on uh, Google Plus. That'll be the next event. And uh, talking, talking, no freezer talking. <laughs> um, I don't. I think astronomy cast is on hiatus while Pamela is still in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> 